Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our final cyber mentoring for the 21-22 school year. Um, the PATHS project is so excited to be able to bring you uh, Miss Mary O'Neill with DHR Health, and we're going to talk about summer safety and lots and lots and lots of, of things that we want you to be thinking about this summer and doing. Um, Remember, students, that this is recorded and you'll watch it on YouTube later if you want to. And you can also watch any of our other um, cyber mentoring videos that we had. We know that you all have very busy summers and this is a good way um, for you to spend some time every day uh, keeping that learning going. Um, so welcome, Miss Mary. How are you doing? I'm doing great this morning and I'm excited to be here. I'm very excited <laughs> to have you here. Um, what, what are we going to talk about today? Okay, so I put together a little presentation primarily on how we can live well, stay active, eat nutritiously, getting enough sleep. Um, I also put just a little bit of an overview. We'll touch on just um, a little bit about our bodies, how they work, some of our specific organs, and why it's so important to maintain health for the health of those organs. And then the first thing I was going to start off doing was talking a little bit about nursing. Um, nursing is obviously very close to my heart. Um, so would you like me to go ahead and get started? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. So first, um, my name is Mary, and I've been a nurse for 12 years now. Um, and I'll touch a little bit about why I got into nursing in case it's something that might interest any of y'all. So since I was a little kid, I always was so interested in how our bodies work. Um, and I've always wanted to work with people. I never saw myself in a desk job, which in a little bit of a hilarious way right now in nursing, I kind of am in a desk job, but I always saw myself being very active and um, wanting to work with people and really wanting to promote wellness and health. Um, I grew up in sports. I did soccer and track and swimming and always loved being outdoors. And I'm grateful that I had a mom that loved to cook nutritiously and took us to the farmer's market all the time when we were kids. Mm -hmm. um, growing up in Virginia, we lived near a lot of local farmers and my mom was friends with all of them. And so we had our own specific orders that we would go to and um, these really awesome vendors. But it gave me a love and a passion for finding a um, really plant-based diet and really getting a lot of nutritious food and seeing how much healthier we are when we eat whole foods. Good. Um, some other things that really interested me in nursing was once I got on a little bit older and I was in middle school and high school and I got into anatomy classes and physiology classes and chemistry and biology, I always knew that science had such a big part of my heart. I've been fascinated with how our bodies work. Um, I think it is so awesome to see how our bodies adapt to stress, meaning how we respond to any different type of um, insult or injury or illness that can overcome our body and how we can adapt and come out stronger with an even greater and an advanced immune system on the other side. And how so many of our own lifestyle choices and the decisions we make and the way we live our lives can promote wellness and can really give us the best chance for that long, healthy life. So classes that I really focused on in high school were anatomy, physiology, biology, and chemistry. And so call me a nerd, but I loved them. <laughs> love that um, too. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed them. I also volunteered at some of our um, nursing homes and some of our elderly facilities. And I think I was always really taken back by um, the physical limitations and the challenges that a lot of our elderly have to overcome to be able to accomplish a lot of the basic tasks that we do every day. So things like brushing your teeth and bathing and showering and things that we take for granted and how as we get older and as our bodies start to decline, those can become really challenging again for us. And what it really made me wanna dive into is how can we really prepare our bodies for the best, most functional future so that we can live this healthy life and have a really good quality of life when we're older. 
And I know I'm talking to elementary schoolers and middle schoolers and high schoolers, and y'all are on the youthful side of health, right? So you should have these really strong, able, capable bodies. Mm -hmm. But the decisions we make when we're young will impact us forever. And what an awesome time to start making those decisions to live a really good life. So I'll tell you a little bit about what nursing school looked for me and then uh, the nursing careers some some opportunities and then we'll get dive into some um, healthy living. Great. So first nursing school was a balance. Um, I went to University of Virginia and I got my bachelor's degree in nursing. So it was a balance of I took a um, theology class, I took writing classes and history classes, but we also had a lot of strictly nursing classes as well. I think one thing that I really enjoyed about nursing school was what we call clinical time, where in nursing, we got to go to the hospital and we would take a whole wing of our university hospital. And as nursing students, we got to care for those patients. So the day before I went to um, clinical, I would go there the afternoon before and I would research my patients and I'd read through their whole chart and I would go home and I'd look up everything I didn't know. I would look up their medications. I would look up all the surgeries they've had, all the past medical history, so all the diseases and things that they've had to overcome because a lot of our patients were older individuals. So they've had such a long life and so much experience and they've been through a lot. And so I got to learn not only about their the management of their long term situations, but also their short term situations as well. And then another big thing that I really enjoyed in nursing school was being able to um, practice a lot on each other. <laughs> so um, our nursing students, we all got to do a lot of physical assessments on each other, and we even got to do injections on each other. <laughs> so I had, um, I put a little picture here of uh, the day I was very, very scared. We practiced on an orange and then our second try was on each other. So I picked my partner very carefully that day because I knew this girl is going to put a needle in my arm and I want to make sure she knows her landmarks <laughs> and she knows what she's doing. So we just used saline, which is salt water, but we got to practice the injection technique for administering vaccines and other injections um, in the muscle. because so we can give it medicine in the muscle that absorbs into our bodies. And that was always a lot of fun to be able to practice a lot of things on each other. We even practiced kind of bathing each other. We wore swimsuits to, to class <laughs> doing practice bed baths. Um, and then we all had a partner with a guy and we got to practice shaving their face. <laughs> uh, so, so a lot of- I, So I have a question about that. So yeah. how about, do you have to do, when you're in nursing school, do you do a lot of injections before you give one to a patient? Because I know when I get injections, the nurses seem to really know what they're doing. And I, I mean, even though it's scary, it doesn't ever really hurt too much because they haven't done before I have time to get scared. So what, <laughs> like, do you practice a lot? So I'll, I'll say our school, we practiced on an orange and then we practiced on each other a couple of times and then we would go with the patients. Now, because we were in nursing school and we weren't licensed as registered nurses yet, while we were in school, we always had a nurse with us when we, uh, when we would do our injection so that their license covered us. Um, I will tell you, once you learn the technique and you learn your landmarks, um, you always understand that going quickly and, you know, making sure that you do it correctly is really important. And so you don't want to slowly um, do right. something that might take longer. It's just going to cause a lot more anxiety in your patient. Um, and then again, once you do a couple, you feel good to go and you're, yeah. you're ready to move forward. <laughs> That's why they're good at it then. <laughs> yes. Um, and then nursing careers. There are so many different careers in nursing. And when I was in elementary school, we had um, on one of our career days, we had a lady who was in the operating room and she came to school with a hair bouffant and with little shoe coverings. And I thought she was so cool because she passed 
pair of bouffants and shoe coverings to, to us um, as part of the little career day favors. And I thought any job that you can get and you get this cool hairnet, I want to be a part of. So that was something else that made me really excited. Now I will tell you on my daily practice, I don't wear a hairnet nor do I wear shoe covers. Those are primarily done in our uh, procedural areas right. for in order to, to ensure that everything is very clean, what we call sterile in the hospital to make sure that we're not introducing any bacteria or microbes, which are little, little pathogens that might cause an infection in a surgical procedure or when a patient is in an operating room. Um, we also have emergency nurses and what an exciting job to be really on the front line of anything that can walk through um, that door in the hospital. And um, at some time in your life, you may know someone who goes to the ER and, and um, it can be a very scary time. And how awesome is it to be received by a nurse who's confident and able to really assess you and make you feel comfortable and make you feel very well cared for. And I think that is such an awesome type of nursing that you are the first person that, um, that really scared patient sees. And you also have such a wide um, range of skills because you don't have one specific specialty, but you see every kind of patient, mm -hmm. whether it's a broken arm or a heart attack or a stroke or any problem that could happen, a car accident where you're bleeding, any type of emergency, you come and that nurse can handle you and can really give you good care. And I've always thought that's just a really incredible position. And then there are also, I put a little picture of a pediatric unit because I know we may have some elementary schoolers who um, listen, but when you go to, for your annual checkups, for your annual health checkups and you get your vaccines, um, and sometimes they'll take some blood on you and they listen to your heart and your lungs and you'll have nurses there that care for you as well. And when I was a kid, I remember, I still remember this day, the nurse at my pediatric office, her name was Sylvia. And my brothers and I all talked about Sylvia because we thought she was evil because she gave us shots. <laughs> and so we were like, Sylvia, and really thought she was probably the meanest person out there because she loved to stick needles in kids. Um, and then now I became Sylvia as an adult. So uh, <laughs> my forgiveness to her for really um, demonizing her as a child. We'll have but, to say Mary, um, like Mary. <laughs> That's probably what they're doing about with me. You're right. <laughs> All right, any questions on nursing before I dive into a little bit about um, healthy living and, and things that we can apply for not only you and your future, but also your family's future? It doesn't look like we do, but for everyone who's participating, okay. if you have any questions for Ms. O'Neill, all you have to do is put them in the chat and uh, she'll take a break every once in a while and we'll ask her the questions. All right, okay. okay. So first thing I wanted to go through was just some basics on living healthy. Now we're gonna talk about healthy eating, about staying active, getting enough sleep, reducing stress and making really good habits and good decisions in our lives to really have the best future and the healthiest bodies and minds. Yes. Um, what's so cool about our bodies is we have two levels of our immune system. So remember, our bodies, we're going to come in contact with the grossest things out there in the world, right? Yeah. I mean, everything. And if, and if this, the past couple of years have taught us anything through this pandemic is there are viruses and bacteria and fungi and parasites and all the dirtiest things in the world. So why are we not all living in the hospital and all just fatally ill all the time? Because we have these incredible, strong immune systems and we have several levels of immunity. So the two big levels of immunity are innate immunity and adaptive immunity. And innate immunity is our first line of defense. And this includes everything from our skin to our mucous membranes, meaning when I touch something that's dirty, my skin protects my insides from that, that bacteria and those dirty um, objects from actually contaminating or, or kind of soiling my insides, right? Um, my mucous membranes, they trap bacteria, they trap pathogens when I try to breathe them in or when I touch my eyes or my mouth. My, the acids in our stomach, 
they kill all sorts of bad bacteria and bad pathogens so that it doesn't get into my insides. But we have so many different levels of immunity and it's influenced so closely with our lifestyle decisions, how we eat, our stress levels, our sleep. That's so important to maintain that healthy lifestyle and to maintain that healthy immune system. So let's talk a little bit about how we can eat healthy and make really good decisions. So, oops, I skipped two slides, there we go. So I put some of our favorite foods in our house that are healthy things to eat. And I will tell you that we all love unhealthy foods too, right? And life is meant to be enjoyed and we should have treats. But the majority of the foods we eat, we should think of as fuel for our bodies. We should think of these foods as how can we best power our bodies to live the strongest, healthiest life. And what's so cool about so many fruits and vegetables is that they're filled with something called micronutrients. And micronutrients are little vitamins and minerals and polyphenols and antioxidants and these little chemical compounds that what they do is they help to protect our body and to build up our immune system and to fight against internal stress and daily stresses. And the whole process of aging is something that if we break it down is something that's caused by oxidative stress. And that's a big word, but what that means is it's a series of these little reactions in our body that start to break down our bodies. And that is the pathology or the underlying mechanism behind diseases and behind aging. And it's one of the reasons that our skin wrinkles and that our organs age and that our, we get heart disease and lung disease. The, the underlying pathology behind the app is going to be that oxidative stress. And what's so cool is how many foods we have in our, in, on our earth that fight the, the, that oxidative stress. And they give us something called antioxidants. And a powerful one is vitamin C. And so what kind of foods do we think of when we think of vitamin C? Usually citrus, right? We think of our oranges and lemons, right? Um, those citrus fruits are so high in vitamin C. But so many of our plants and herbs and spices really bring these powerful compounds that help maintain health. Mushrooms. Now, I know a lot of kids don't like mushrooms. I love mushrooms, but I'm the only one in my family who does. So whenever I cook anything, I have to make you know, the dish for everyone and then my portion and I load up the mushrooms because I love them so much. So I, I understand we will all have different healthy foods that we enjoy, but I think the important thing is finding the, those healthy foods that you love and really making an effort to make that a really important part of your daily life. Um, one way you can do that is grocery shopping with your family. So instead of going, what can, some, what can be really convenient is picking up fast food, right? So um, I love Whataburger. I love In-N-Out. I love a lot of fast food. Too. I love Chick-fil-A. <laughs> but going and buying foods from the earth, so going to the produce section at HEB and seeing how much beautiful produce is available and finding things that you and your family love. And if your family doesn't buy a lot of produce, going there and trying some new things, trying some new berries, trying some new vegetables, because you'll be surprised that you'll enjoy a lot of them. And um, I always try to, to make sure our kids get plenty of fruits and vegetables, but I also try to be cognizant or really aware of the fact that they may not like specific ones and I won't force them too often. I won't force them too <laughs> often to, to eat ones that they, that they genuinely don't like, but I work to find ones that they do enjoy and really make sure that I always have those on hand and always have them in abundance so that they can, when they want a snack, they can grab a banana or a clementine or an apple, the fruits that they really, really enjoy, that that's always available for them and they always have the option for healthy snacks. Right. I also put nuts on here too. The, the healthy fats from nuts and from fish are so good for your brain and for your heart and really, really protects against inflammation. And inflammation is a very complex process and it has a lot of different roles in our life. Inflammation can be good. So when we think about inflammation, we think about heat, 
swelling, pain, right? So if I were to cut my arm or get a big bug bite, it may become red and swollen and inflamed, right? Um, and that's good. What it's doing is it's bringing more blood flow and more um, like pathogen fighting cells to that area to take care of it and to allow that area to heal. But long-term or prolonged inflammation causes damage of our tissues and can really wear down our bodies. And a lot of healthy fats help to protect against that inflammation. I also put water here. Because we live in that. South Texas, and if y'all don't know, it is hot. It's hot outside, <laughs> right? Um, we are definitely in a hot season. And so wherever you go this summer, I encourage y'all to be outdoors. I encourage y'all to get active, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But we always want to make sure we have water available. Because when you're out somewhere, there'll be a vending machine with Cokes and a lot of different sodas. And those are so bad for our bodies. That sugar, those really high sugar contents, they, they, they spike your blood sugar levels and then they plummet. And what that does is it creates this release of this hormone from our body called insulin. And that insulin goes really, really high. And that causes damage to the inside of our blood vessels, not only in the short term, but definitely in the long term. And they've done studies on people even really recently after eating fried foods or drinking, drinking sodas and how the insides of our bodies look differently immediately after eating these things, right? Now, I'm not saying you can never have a Coke or Pepsi again in your life, but it should be that rare little treat you have and not your daily habit. So I have one of these massive water bottles in our car for whenever the kids get thirsty. And whenever we go anywhere, everyone brings a water bottle because when you're thirsty, I want you to drink water. And for some reason, our kids, their, their um, instinct when we get back from the park, and this makes me want to throw up, but they want a big <laughs> glass of milk. And I'm like, why do you want milk? Like you're thirsty, <laughs> they're sweating. But I make them drink a big glass of water and then they can have our milk. Remember, our bodies are mostly made of water and dehydration is so hard on our organs. So we wanna make sure we stay really, really hydrated so our metabolism and our body can function at its best. It's good for your skin, it's good for all of your organs to stay really well hydrated. And then I also put the, I put the fish and the chicken here to show some good sources of protein. Protein is so good for your muscles. And when you're young and you're growing, you want to be growing these powerful, strong muscles and build up all this collagen to make you sturdy and able and good at your sports and good at all the activities we're doing. So it's important to increase that protein intake. And protein is also good to keep you full. When you eat a high protein meal, so if you choose eggs for breakfast, you're going to feel full a lot longer than if you choose um, if you choose like Lucky Charms or tricks, right? That's going to keep you full for an hour or two. Whereas a really good, like a Greek yogurt or eggs, that can keep you full until lunchtime, really, really keeping that appetite under control. All right, staying active. We all have different ways that we stay active. And I think one of the most important things is that you stay active in the way that you love to stay active because activity should be joyful. And our US Department of Health and Human Services, which is our health department, they recommend that kids under five, so for age three to five, that they get three hours of activity a day, right? And then kids who are a little bit older, they recommend at least an hour to an hour and a half of moderate to vigorous activity. That doesn't mean video games with screaming, right? <laughs> that means running on the playground, tackling your friends, playing sports, really enjoying uh, throwing the ball with your family, really um, staying active in a way you like. Again, it should be something that brings joy to you, whether that is a sport that you love. So it could be soccer or football or basketball or gymnastics. Our kids do Ninja Academy and they love being Ninja Warriors. So whatever sport really brings you um, kind of the, the, that desire to continue to participate and really makes you feel strong and able is what you should choose. And then you can also find a lot of fun hobby things like playgrounds. So Playgrounds are so awesome to build coordination, to build grip strength, so hanging from monkey bars, um, and can really give you a lot of 
functional improvement as well. And it's so good for, especially for our elementary age kids to be playing on those playgrounds, climbing things. It gives them such good muscle coordination and really the ability to have good um, uh, uh, grip strength and also really good functional independence and understand the capabilities of their own bodies. Now, there are a lot of different ways to stay active, and there are a couple different types of exercise. So we talk about aerobic exercise, and we talk about strength training. We also talk about balance exercise, and then also mobility and flexibility. So first, aerobic exercise. That's what's going to get your heart rate racing. And so this could be something as simple as walking, going on a walk with your family, um, to running around playing soccer or basketball, to going on a bike ride with your friend, to um, playing tag at the park. All those are going to have you moving and running and your heart racing and racing. And that really helps the blood pumping through your body, helps your heart and your lungs to become stronger because it gives you a, your body a little bit of stress. And what are what youthful bodies or y'all's youthful bodies are so good at is adapting, meaning when you give them bits of stress, they get better. So you run around and guess what? When you're running around a little bit every day, your body now thinks that that running around is easy and you can run around more and more the next week and more and more the next week. And that's what's so cool about stress, especially on young bodies, is that your body adapts and becomes more fit and more able the more with that um, stress that's applied to it. Mm -hmm. Another type of stress we can apply to our body is through strength training or muscles. And so when you think of strength training, you probably think of the big, strong people at the gym with a squat rack or big weights. <laughs> and when you're a kid, you don't need to do that. I know sometimes our, maybe some of our high schoolers will be doing that, but right. uh, little kids don't need to be doing that. Uh, but ways that you can get strong is trying to do push-ups or some sit-ups that can give you really good strength. And my dad was in the army. And one thing that he had us do um, every Friday night was do push as many push-ups and sit-ups as we could. And we did it before we go to bed, which in hindsight probably isn't the greatest way to like <laughs> roll down and go to sleep with your four kids. But that was like our weekend routine um, was he wanted us to try as many push-ups and sit-ups as we could. But I remember always feeling so able and strong and really capable because of that training that we did even as little kids. And so it's something that we do with our kids too. We always have them do, do little circuit workouts and they love it. So they know before they ask if they can watch a TV show, they ask how many push-ups and sit-ups they have to do first. And ah. then they give them a little circuit workout and then they can earn their screen time. Good idea. Well, <laughs> um, and then we'll move on to a little bit of, of balance. Balance is so important. Um, some of us will be more balanced than others just naturally. I will tell you, I am not a very coordinated person naturally. Um, so I to either. I never have been. It has nothing to do with age. Yeah. I remember being little and not having good balance. And we all have different genetic predispositions or different um, gifts that we were given when, fr from birth that we'll be really good at some things naturally and other things we're going to have to work way but, harder than our peers at. But I'm very <laughs> strong. I know that I'm very strong, oh, but not good. very balanced. <laughs> not very balanced. Um, things that we can do to practice on that, we can, you know, at, at the park, they'll have balance beans. Um, you can also practice standing on one leg or hopping on one leg. Obviously, when you're first trying this, maybe make sure you have a table or something you can stabilize yourself on. But balancing exercises are really good because you'll have little neuromuscular firings of different muscles that help to to keep and stabilize your body. And it really helps you too to prevent falls when you're running and maybe there's a little bit of an uneven surface, it can help you to prevent twisting your ankle or injuries in the future. And then lastly is flexibility. So when you're younger, your, your tissues are just much more elastic and you have a lower risk for pulling a muscle. And when I say pulling a muscle, I mean you overstretch that muscle and you have these little tears in that muscle. And it can stem anywhere from teeny little tears that make you a little bit sore to extremely sore and unable to, to use a certain muscle for a while and sometimes even require surgery. So we always want to make sure that we're stretching and, and maintain that flexibility, especially as we're getting stronger. As our muscles are growing, we also want to make sure that that elasticity is keeping up. And you may have seen people who have really, really muscular legs, but they can't touch their toes. 
right? And so you want both, ideally, right? That we have this balance of strength, but also that elastic um, uh, ability that we have really good prevention against injury in the future. So I have a question. Uh, yes. You're talking about these two things, in a, and I want to connect them. And I, I will tell you something that I've heard uh, from some parents and grandparents, um, and they're saying, but in the summer in South Texas, it's too hot to be outside. Um, and I happen to think that it's not too hot to be outside, uh, but I do think there's some precautions that you have to take. So can we talk about staying active in you know, the hot, hot weather? Very, very good question. And I meant to touch on this, but thank you for, for bringing that up. First, middle of the day is hot. There is no way around it. And running outside at the park between 11 and one is not going to be fun. You are gonna be exhausted and you can be at risk for overheating. So that does not mean you should stay inside all day, but there are times of the day where the sun is lower. Now we still have high humidity. Humidity is all that moisture in the air, meaning you're gonna feel hot because you're sweating and that sweat doesn't evaporate, taking that heat with it as well, but you're able to not overheat as easily. So earlier in the morning and then later in the evening as the sun starts to set are better times if you're going to do something like going to the park. Now, one thing that we have in McAllen and Edinburgh are a lot of those water parks as well. So they have the little splash pads where you can run around. They have the playgrounds right next to them. And then the splash pads where you can do a lot of water sports. There are pools for swimming. So there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of ability to stay active outside using water. And then even at your own home, having the sprinkler set up or something where you can be outdoors and then also kind of staying cool. Um, clothing, thinking about your clothing. So cotton clothing is really breathable, uh, making sure that you have good footwear that's comfortable. And then like we talked about having good fuel and fuel both includes good food that you're eating, healthy foods, and then also good hydration. And we wanna be overly careful about having good hydration. And sometimes in the summer too, we may need something with some electrolytes because you're sweating a lot, right? right? And when we sweat, we don't just sweat, H2O, which is water. We lose magnesium. We lose salt. We lose potassium. We lose a lot of these really important electrolytes that help maintain this chemical balance. And we can feel really dizzy and kind of woozy if we just replace them with water. And so there's some good sugar-free electrolyte replacement drinks like Propel or Gatorade Zero, where you can get some of those electrolytes back, especially if you're having longer periods in the sun. Um, there's even, there are even a lot of brands that you can buy, the hydrate brands um, that you can buy, the little packs that you can put in your water bottle that are sweetened with stevia or have a little bit of flavor. Um, and then they include a lot of electrolytes to make sure that you're not just replacing with water. But yes, staying hydrated is going to be super important, taking breaks, and then looking for shade too. So mm -hmm. The sun here is very powerful, especially mm -hmm. midday. So doing things in the shade feels very differently from doing things under that bright Texas sun. Mm -hmm. So very good point. It's, it is harder to stay active. And I think anywhere you live in the country, not just South Texas, but anywhere you live, you're going to have a couple months of the year where it's a lot harder to get outside. So our friends up in Wisconsin are going to say, oh, that's uh, December through March. We can't <laughs> go outdoors. It's like zero degrees and right. there's three feet of snow. Well, for us, it's June through August. We can't. It's hard to get outside ex except in little hour increments and staying really well hydrated. So we're going to have to be careful during the summer that we're staying hydrated, that we're staying cool, that you're taking breaks, and that you have access to air conditioning as well. Right. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sleep. Sleep is so critically important to, to recovery. So we have two types of something called our autonomic nervous system, which is our involuntary nervous system. And one type kind of stresses us and excites us, and the other type slows us down and allows us to relax. And that the, the one that slows us down and allows us to relax and recover is called the parasympathetic nervous system. Huge word, but it really allows our body to rest, recover, and restore. And during that time, during that deep sleep, especially, we actually create new immune cells 
to fight off infections, to fight off bacteria, to prevent future illness. We build up broken down tissue. We repair those muscles that were kind of beaten up during the day if we had a really rough workout or we were had a really rigorous, stressful um, exercise. Our bodies just recover while we are sleeping. But we need both our non-REM sleep and our REM sleep. So those are two big categories of sleep. And REM sleep is when it's, it's called rapid eye movement sleep. And what happens there is that's when we dream, but it's our heart rate actually elevates a little bit, our breathing elevates a little bit, and our brain sends this little message to all of our limbs to almost kind of become paralyzed so that we don't actually act out our dreams. Because I don't know if y'all have had dreams where you're like running and doing things. I always have dreams of like team building. So I'm always like, oh, we were in this thing and we're all trying to work together to figure out this thing. And it would be weird if in the middle of the night, I'm like running around the house doing things, right? So my brain tells my body that you can think you're doing all this, but you're going to lay there in bed and just rest. <laughs> so your brain is really active, but during that REM sleep is when memory starts to get stored and ingrained. So you could see how, how it's going to impact your learning if you're not getting good sleep, right? Now we go through about four to six cycles of this REM and non-REM sleep every night. But this is what's so important. Recovery is just as important as the stress that we're applying to try to cause that adaptation during the day. So I told you that I want you to stress your body, your youthful, young, healthy bodies a little bit so that your bodies get stronger. But your bodies won't get stronger if you don't allow them to recover and rebuild and adapt to that stress. We have to recover. And not having enough stress causes correlates with a lot of different diseases. So you probably recognize that when you didn't sleep well, you're moodier, right? So um, your brother annoys you, um, your teacher is more boring, your classmates are just you know, bothering you. Everything is more bothersome and irritating and frustrating when you're exhausted and you're tired, right? We can recognize that. You also don't think as clearly. You forgot your homework, you didn't do this, you didn't do a good job on your test. Um, you're not performing as well when we don't sleep well. But it also correlates with real disease. And maybe you'd be surprised to find out that lack of sleep correlates with heart disease, with dementia, so brain disease, with diabetes and obesity. So a uh, lack of sleep impairs our hormonal profile, which causes the restructuring of how our bodies work. So we end up having elevated stress hormones because our body that wants to recover is not able to recover. So our body starts sending out this hormone called cortisol and epinephrine and norepinephrine, which are these little stress molecules to try to keep you alert when your body just wants to rest. And it causes fatigue and exhaustion. And what also happens is it increases your hunger levels too. So when we eat, we secrete something called leptin, which helps us to realize that, oh, I'm full. I don't need to eat again right now. Mm -hmm. And then when we're hungry, we receive our body um, releases something called ghrelin. I always think ghrelin, like my, my tummy's ghrelin or ghrelin. <laughs> um, so when, when, when you're stressed, you release more ghrelin and your leptin is suppressed. So you're more hungry and you're less satisfied by that meal because your body essentially is like, I'm dying. I need energy. I need energy. And so it's this kind of instinctive survival mechanism where your body's fighting for life, fighting for life and wanting all this additional food that your body wouldn't need if you just rested well. Right. Now, what are some things that you can do this summer and throughout the year and in your future to rest well? Habits. Okay, so don't go to bed at 10 on weekdays or 9 on weekdays and then 2 a.m. on weekends, right? You need to have a consistent bedtime. Our body has an internal clock called a circadian clock. And what that clock does is it releases melatonin at night in response to darkness in response to lack of blue light, meaning your cell phone, your TV screen, um, your computer, all of that stimulates you. When you see that blue light in daytime, it suppresses melatonin and it increases cortisol, which keeps you awake and alert. 
right? So it's harder to fall asleep. And when you do fall asleep, your sleep is not as restful and as quality filled because your circadian rhythm is off. Your melatonin is suppressing your body mental, um, mental status as much. And so your rhythm gets all abnormal. Now, there are going to be some things where we can't always control and have the perfect trajectory on our bedtime, right? But routine and consistency is important. So you may have a project that keeps you up late one night. Um, none of y'all, I'm sure none of y'all procrastinate. All y'all get your homework done way ahead of time. Way so you ahead. Right into <laughs> and you never wait till the night before your project to <laughs> try to write that 10-day shape or whatever. Um, but working hard to make sure that you have a consistent bedtime and a consistent waking time really helps your body understand when do I produce those sleepy hormones to prepare my body for rest? And when do I produce those wake hormones to pre prepare my body for alertness and for action? And tricking your body by having all these different wake rest cycles really impairs our healing and impairs our function. And so you're going to have reduced physical capabilities. So your sports performance, everything, your, your mental performance will be reduced because you're not on that adequate rhythm. So reducing screen time before bed is really, really important. Um, one thing that we do is um, we have our kids read for the 30 minutes before bedtime. We don't do a TV show for the 30 minutes before bedtime so that they're not stimulated by some blue light and sounds and all of this stuff. And that's really helped them to sleep harder and sleep through the night better mm -hmm. and have a much more consistent um, wake sleep schedule. We give them 30 minutes later on weekends than we do during the week, but we don't give them three hours later on weekends right. than we do during the week. So a little bit of adjustment because, hey, it's the weekend, but not some big shifting your whole life back. Okay. I'm so glad that you said that because that's the one question I was going to bring up because I know for a lot of students during the school year, they do that. They have a nice early bedtime because they have school the next day. But on the weekends, it is hours later. And, and I agree with you. I think it's okay maybe an hour later, but not hours and hours later. And then in the summer, it's going to take you, even if you decide, okay, it's summer, I'm going to have a different schedule. Um, it's going to take you weeks to get used to that new schedule. And then in a few more weeks, you're just going to have to go back to school schedule. So not yeah. a Monday through Friday schedule, but a Sunday through Saturday schedule should be what you're following. Yes. And, um, you know, one thing that we go through as nurses is challenge with shift work. So right. that is kind of the involuntary um, shifting your, your night schedules. Yeah. And when I first started nursing, when I was 21, um, we did six weeks of night shift and then six weeks of day shift. And I can't tell you how fatigued my body felt. And I'm normally a high energy, feel good, like try to be healthy person. And I felt tired and I felt moody and cranky and not myself during those, the, that shift work. And as soon as I switched to just day shift, I was like perky, nothing bothered me. And I was back to myself. And what I realized was my body cannot handle that night, day, night, day. And while, you know, a few hours is not a whole 12 hour swap, it still has that tricking of your body isn't consistently releasing these hormones for wake and sleep and yeah. rest and alertness well. And so your body is not recovering and activating as well. So you are more tired during the day and, and, and then you're more alert at night because your body's confused what is night and what is day, almost like a newborn. All the time, yes, yes. Great idea. Okay, Cre creating healthy habits. Um, so finding, I, I think one important thing is finding hobbies that you love that really foster good connections. So fostering friendships with others, fostering, um, you know, and again, this is gonna be very developmental, like age related. So when, we, when I think of kids, I think a lot of building with Legos because it helps them be creative. It helps them understand different um, kind of configurations. Um, and it helps them really to imagine and invent. Reading, reading is good at 
every age level, you will find that reading will help you with your writing. Reading will help you with your speech. Reading will help you be more articulate, meaning more um, you're able to communicate your thoughts a lot better. You're able to express yourself in the way that you desire to. Um, if you have a feeling, you're able to make someone else understand what you're feeling instead of struggling to find the correct words. Reading will improve your academics and your friendships in so many ways. It also, I think, gives you a lot more to think about. And one of the things I challenge y'all to do this summer is finding what reading you love. Because I did not know I loved to read until probably 11th grade. I thought I didn't like reading because I didn't like the books that our school made us read. Right. And everyone has different preferences. And now there is nothing I love more than diving into a good book. And I almost don't even want to go to bed at night because it's so good. <laughs> like I don't, I don't want to finish it. I'm so sad when I finish that book because I want it to keep going. Mm -hmm. And so finding a genre, an author, someone that you really relate to, that you love, that challenges you, that stimulates you, that meets that area of interest, and that will grow your mind and really, really improve your, your thought and your academics and your performance in so many ways. Um, drawing is another great creative outlet. Again, I put an elementary school picture here, but people can draw on so many different levels. I probably still draw like an elementary schooler. So this is my <laughs> level at which I am, my artistic capabilities are, but we have people who are very, very good. One of my best friends is an incredible incredible artist and watching her hone in on that as we were growing up together was so powerful to see and then as an adult she got her um her she majored she had a science major and she used that for her career and now she's actually kind of diving in and created an Etsy shop and some other things to to use her art and to bring that as like a little side hobby and it's cool to see her be able to incorporate her art um and she's writing a book now with these all these different food things but it was just really awesome to see her um, be able to utilize that hobby for her future life in her 30s. And so really honing in on what your um, interests are in a way that really fine tunes where your gifts are. Um, I think screen time can be really challenging in that um, it's an easy entertainment through summer boredom, but does very little to, to challenge you or to make you think or to grow you as a person or to make right. you more prepared for the next school year or and, and can even stunt your ability to um, have good social interactions with others face to face. So I challenge you to reduce screen time this summer and, and put that screen time, what you would have had in screen time into play dates with friends, whether you're elementary schoolers or coffee date with friend or um, meeting up with people and having really good face-to-face -face communication, finding something that both y'all like to do. Do you like to both go on a run? Do you like to play sports together? Do you want to go swimming together? Do you want to do something outdoors and active together? Um, cooking a healthy meal together, you know, finding something that you both love to do that will keep you active and really keep that face-to-face -face social engagement. There's a lot, there's a lot of mental illness that really increased throughout um, the pandemic from that lack of social interaction. And as humans, we are meant to be in community with others. And while our family is our community, we have a different level of our comfort with our family than we do with um, our peers. And sometimes in the summer, when the only peers that we see face to face are our family, we can feel this isolation and this anxiety about reintegrating back into that social sphere come August, September, when you go back to school. And that those interactions can be challenging because you start to doubt yourself and doubt your ability to be able to interact and, um, and really socialize with others. So I really challenge y'all as you can to take a step away from the screens, fine tune on your hobbies, on, on those gifts that I know you have, on those skills and really work at those and be proud of those. Um, whether that's pottery or drawing or building or woodwork. I mean, there's so many cool things that I know y'all do that I would never be able to do. So really working on those talents, fine tuning them when you have all that extra time in the summer and, and, and growing yourself and making sure that when you come back in the fall for school, that you're a better person in so many different ways and how much more confidence that that you'll have coming back to school with that 
And again, I, I, as I explained earlier, how we have so much data from the CDC about how much mental illness has risen with this social isolation and how staying in contact face to face with peers is so different than on a screen, even a FaceTime date can be challenging. And I know with um, different locations, when you have friends move away, FaceTime sometimes the best we can do. But as much as we can, getting that real life interaction is really going to help your skills in your communication and your confidence in yourself and your ability to interact with others. Okay. So I have a couple Making smart decisions. I have a couple yeah. comments on that one. Um, yes. Number one is remember that we have a really good library system. Um, I just recently moved to McAllen and I went to the public library because I've been spending lots of money on books and I want to quit spending so much money on books and borrow because then they accumulate and I've been donating them and I thought I have to stop this cycle. So I went to the They're library. expensive. They're expensive. So um, for students, I think a good idea is if you haven't been to the library, go to the library, get a library card because not only can you go and borrow books for, to hold in your hand, but you can borrow books electronically. You can do both. Plus, they have some other things available to you. The other thing that I think is big, 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 and it was on the previous slide, is washing your hands. Um, while I was waiting for my house to be ready, I went to live with my family. And my family was pointing out something that is just second nature to me. Every time I walk in the door from being outside, I wash my hands. It's just a habit to wash my hands. The other thing is before I pick up food that I'm going to eat with my hands or pick up a utensil, I wash my hands. So I wash my hands when I get up in the morning. I wash my hands before each meal. If I go outside and come back in, I wash my hands. It's just my habit. But I did have my family point out to me, man, you are really good at hand washing. And I said, it's, you know, it's from when I was a child and we were told to wash our hands. I did. And it's just continued as an adult. So these are some really good habits, students. Uh, think about going to the library. Ask your parents um, if they can take you to get a library card and remember to wash your hands. Um, again, making good decisions are so important in your future. And I think one of the big things that can help you with this is finding friends with good values. Finding friends who are able to think for themselves and not just do what the crowd is doing. Um, making good decisions for your future and not what would be easiest right now all the time. Um, of course, some of the really big ones are staying away from drugs, um, staying away from cigarettes. We know how these can ruin lives, destroy your health. Um, we have people with permanent lung injury from vaping where their lungs will never have the elasticity and never be healthy again. And these are teenagers who will forever struggle to fully breathe well during anything more than a normal activity be from vaping and from, from, from smoking. So staying away from drugs, staying away from smoking is going to be so critically important, especially if you, when people have more time over the summer. Um, sometimes there can be a tendency or a pressure to get into things that maybe you didn't have time that for during the school year because you had sports and activities and you kind of had so much to, to occupy yourself. Again, that's why I urge you to find those hobbies, find those talents that you love, that you're good at, and really dive into those full force and building solid friendships with people who have similar values and, and being confident enough in your own values to be able to encourage a friend to make good decisions too. Um, and not fearful that you'll lose a friendship over making a decision that you're saying um, you care about them and this is why you're gonna share this with them. Um, and then that we touched on this a little bit, but encouraging your family to live a healthier life too. You love your mom, you love your dad, you love your aunt, you love your grandma. Um, bring them in on some of your healthy lifestyle decisions. So you want to go to the grocery store and, and build some really, make some really good recipes with um, some whole foods, you know, go with your mom, go with your dad, go with your brother and sister and pick out some really healthy foods that y'all love together. 
do an outdoor activity together. Um, and if y'all are going on trips or going on vacations, research trails that you could um, walk on, research things that you could do outside, mountains you can climb, activities that you can do that are active, that are surrounded by being outdoors, that really help y'all um, stay healthy together and encouraging that. And sometimes it's as simple as um, you're going to walk the dog. The dog's going to be so happy and love you for it. Bring your mom up with you too. And she'll love that, that she can chat with you and talk about your day. And it's also good exercise for her. It's good exercise for your dad. It's good exercise for your aunt or your grandma who lives with you. And, and them continuing that mobility is really important. And you have this uh, ability to um, include them in on a lot of your healthy lifestyle decisions and really help them build new habits too. If they have, as we build these really uh, busy lifestyles, your parents may work super hard and they're always busy. And, and, and a lot of times our busy lifestyles is like in the car dropping off someone and sitting at the computer and very sedentary lifestyle and including them in your activities including them in your healthy eating can really help their health as well help them to live longer better lives all right so i have only have a couple minutes left but i, <laughs> I always wish i could talk to you for like five hours I go. <laughs> um, so we'll just do do a couple moments again. I just wanted to include a few things on our organs and why we talked a lot about how our lifestyle um, choices affect overall health. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about organ specific um, health and then I'll open it up to questions if you'll have any questions. So first our heart. So in the far left, I put our heart here. Remember our heart is a really strong organ and it pumps blood throughout our entire body and blood brings oxygen to every cell in your whole body. And your heart is this strong, adaptable muscle. And what can you do to have better heart health? You can eat well. You can stay away from drugs. You can exercise and allow your heart to become stronger, be more forcefully, be uh, adapt better to that cardiovascular and that strength training that you, um, that, you, that you cause it to go through. And then sleeping well so your heart can recover and relax. I talked to you about sugary drinks and how that damages the lining of our blood vessels. And that can contribute to something called atherogenesis. And that's what eventually leads to heart attacks. And so having that really high sugary processed diet can predispose you or make you more likely to have a heart attack in the future. And what we always say is genetics will kind of set you up for certain problems in life. Meaning if you have a family history for heart disease, you're more likely than your friend to get heart disease, but you are not destined for heart disease. Your lifestyle choices impact that, that you may be more likely to get it. So you have to make even better decisions than your friend does to avoid going down that road. Our lungs, our lungs are so powerful. So we know that our upper airways warm and humidify air, our mucus in our nose, all our boogers, they trap <laughs> those pathogens and those pollutants in the air and they warm the air so it doesn't traumatize our trachea, which is our windpipe. So that air is warmed and humidified before it gets to our lungs. And this is where we have gas exchange and your lungs have so much surface area. And what I mean by that is if you were to open up all of your lungs, because they're made up of all these little, what they can call them alveolar sacs, but they look like little grates. If you were to open up all of them, it would span out across a tennis court. That's how big your lungs are. How cool is that? And they are this healthy pink elastic tissue. But what smoking does is it puts tar and, and black coal on your lungs and damages them forever. Okay, so we want to make sure we make good decisions to keep those lungs healthy so that we can have these really good lives forever. And then I put a picture of our gut. And we actually have something interesting. So our gut, I'm talking about our belly, it's our stomach and our intestines. And we have something called a microbiome in our, in our gut. And that the microbiome is where we have a lot of good bacteria inside our belly and intestines. And that good bacteria produces healthy immune cells. And what we've learned, and this, this is kind of new research coming out, but we've learned so much about how our gut health impacts whole body health, impacts brain health, lung health, heart health, vascular health, or our blood vessel health. And what, what can really help with a good gut health is not eating processed foods 
and eating something called probiotics and prebiotics. So probiotics are live bacteria. And that sounds weird, but it's the good bacteria. So what would be an example? Um, Greek yogurt with live cultures. So if you go to the store and go to HEB and get plain Greek yogurt, so not the one with a ton of added sugar, but look at the plain Greek yogurt and you'll look and it, it'll say like lactobacilli or it'll have kind of live cultures on it. And so it, it gave you a good bacteria. So when you eat it, you're bringing this good bacteria into your bellies that then helps your immune system, helps reduce inflammation in your whole body, helps you feel better, helps you recover better. And, um, and then you can also eat prebiotics. Prebiotics come from all these healthy fruits and vegetables that help to feed the good bacteria because your gut will be a balance of good bacteria and bad bacteria. And we wanna feed the good bacteria and not let that bad bacteria overwhelm it because then we get inflammation, stomach aches, stomach cramping, bloating, gas, um, diarrhea, all sorts of belly upset that no one likes, burping, all that can happen when we have that overgrowth of bad bacteria and processed foods and brain health. We talked about fatty fish and how that can be, and, and fatty nuts can be really good for that brain health. Something else that y'all need to do whenever you're riding your scooters or your bikes or your skateboard is wear a helmet. Mm -hmm. We know our skull is very protective. It's a real hard bone, but you can still really damage your brain without a helmet. You need to be wearing a seatbelt in a car. You need to be wearing a helmet during anything with, with, with speed, like biking, right? I see kids all the time in our neighborhood bike without helmets. And I want to be like, where's your helmet? <laughs> I don't, but I want to. <laughs> um, but it is so important because it just takes one time getting nicked by a car, getting falling off at the wrong angle, and you can get a permanent brain bleed that will forever leave you debilitated. It is so important. Our brain defines life, right? So what are the two things that define life? Your brain function and your heart function. So if your brain's not functioning and your brain dead, you are legally dead. If your heart is not functioning, you are legally dead. So if you have a permanent brain injury where you become brain dead, you are legally dead, right? Again, not every bump on the head is going to cause brain death, but Helmets can significantly reduce the risk. I used to, um, I, when I was a swim coach, I did private lessons and I went from, I biked from one pool to the next pool because I was 15, so I didn't have my driver's license yet. And so I biked to a couple different pools to do private lessons and I got hit by a car and I cracked my helmet. But if I didn't have a helmet on, I probably would have been brain dead, right? And so how life-saving that was to me, because I remember when I was a kid and I biked in my neighborhood and my neighbors would roll their window down and they said, if I see you without a helmet again, I'm telling your mom, and I was scared because I put my helmet on, right? <laughs> And so if they hadn't stopped me and, and told me that, I might not have put my helmet on, right? Mm -hmm. And then I might have, you know, not been here today. So wear your helmets, wear your seatbelts. Good idea. Lastly, bones and muscles. So I don't know about y'all's bellies, but everyone has abs like this, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so our bones, we have, we have 206 bones in our body. 126 are, um, are on our limbs. So shoulders, arms, hands, and then legs, feet, right? And then the other 80 are on our um, trunk and our head, okay? Um, I don't have time, I'm kind of I'm out of time, but our bones are so important. What can we do to maintain bone health? Not drink sodas, eat plenty of calcium rich foods and staying active. Yeah. Laying on the couch all day does not help your bone health. Stress helps your bone health. Running, jumping, bouncing, it, your body adapts. The more impact you have on your bones, the stronger your bones become, especially with y'all young, youthful bones. Stay outside, stay active, walking, running, jumping. Activity strengthens bones, okay? So eat well, exercise, your bones stay strong. Muscles, what can we do to, to have good muscular strength? Like we talked about earlier, stress on your muscles makes them stronger, right? So whether that means that you find a little routine that you love that you do with your siblings in the summer, or maybe you pick a best friend and y'all do some Pilates or some little body, body circuits, body weight circuits, um, or whether you're in high school and you do a little weight lift, weightlifting class with your friends, um, all of that really helps that muscular growth with boost your metabolism, which helps protect your spine, protect your organs, protect everything and give you so much more health, right? 
Uh, remember, our bones help serve to protect us too. Our cranium protects our brain. Our ribs protect our heart and our lungs, right? Um, our bodies work so, so hard for us. So we need to treat them well and give them the best chance we have to really optimize health. What questions do y'all have? I think you are very thorough and went through everything. Uh, we don't have any questions right now. One thing that I do want to remind students is this will be available on YouTube or you're probably watching it on YouTube, but you can also go to our website, which is www.pathscentral, P-A-T-H-S-C-E-N-T-R-A-L, pathscentral.com. And we have a video library of many, many more cyber mentoring sessions that you can watch um, all throughout the summer. They'll be available anytime you think you just need a little break, especially in the middle of the day, hot, hot sun, watch a cyber mentoring, do a little learning this summer. That would be a great thing. And Ms. Mary, we want to thank you so much for joining us today. It's always a pleasure when you're our guest. You've given us some really great information, and I want to thank you for um making sure that we leave for the summer with healthy ideas and develop healthy habits or continue healthy habits. So thank you. Thank you. I had so much fun and I hope y'all make good choices this summer. Good. That's great. Thank you, everybody. Bye.